Just because someone claims to be helping you doesn't mean they actually are. In 1956, a drug under the trade name of Contragon was introduced to market, promoted to pregnant women to cure their morning sickness, and it worked. But that drug, more commonly known as thalidomide, resulted in over 10,000 children being born with severe deformities. Starting in 1932, the United States Public Health Service offered free health care to hundreds of African-American men. But in 1972, those men, who were still alive, found out that they were being studied as they fell ill and died while the government left their easily curable syphilis untreated. And about 3,000 years ago, the Greeks left a gift for the Trojans, a large wooden horse, but inside were soldiers who conquered the city of Troy. Today, there's a philosophy masquerading as anti-racism that claims to help black people, but it too is a Trojan horse that harms the very people it proposes to help. This philosophy is encapsulated in quasi-religious texts like Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility. Few books about race have more openly infantilized Black people than this supposedly authoritative tone. It portrays Black people as perpetual victims, always crying, always angry, needing whites to tiptoe around us. It's condescending. Those who practice the bigotry of low expectations demanding testing and academic standards need to be lowered to accommodate Black people, make it appear as if we're incapable of succeeding on the same level as everyone else. Those who claim moral virtue in doing the work are in fact doing the work of making me into a perfect idiot. By focusing on disparate outcomes and that which is problematic, this racist orthodoxy distracts us from doing the actual work that could help improve the lives of Black Americans. Studies on mismatch show that those lowered academic standards cause Black people to attend schools where they're less likely to earn degrees than they would otherwise be. When we look at statistics showing that Black boys are more often suspended in schools, we hear preachers of the orthodoxy argue that the only reason this could be is racist bias, never mind how the effects of poverty might cause it. Mayor Bill de Blasio spearheaded an effort to make sure black boys are disciplined less. But the problem is, there are violence and gangs at predominantly black schools, and disciplining gang members less prevents all the other black students at those schools from learning. It's a very human thing to take on the victim identity. All people do it. A way to do that as a black person is to read a book like White Fragility and say, yes, I want to be treated that way. And it's unfortunate that black thinkers such as Ibram Kendi have adopted this way of thinking too. But this is not the mainstream black view. Yes, we can't has never been the slogan for black America, and it's not now. There are real things we could do that I think would improve life for black Americans. Things like ending the war on drugs, making sure that all women have long lasting reproductive contraception available to them, making sure that all children are taught to read via phonics rather than the whole word method. That might sound wonky, but it's more important than it sounds. And supporting vocational training, getting rid of the idea that everyone has to go to college and pretend to enjoy Shakespeare. If we just did those four things, we'd be in a completely different world. But unfortunately, they don't provide white people with the moral absolution that white fragility supposedly anti-racist practice does. America needs to understand that there's a difference between having a religion and practical political activism. Virtue signaling replacing truly asking what can I do to help is more Martin Luther than Martin Luther King. I'm John McWhorter. Join me in standing for a more productive and genuine anti-racism at fairforall.org.